very good evening one and all it's absolutely a fantastic evening so entire nation entire pulmonologists of the nation is waiting for thursday evening to listen to the stalwarts who participates regularly in the webinars of cci and kudos to dr n h krishna garu okay and the uh, entire team their relentless efforts has made now we are into third year of uh, webinars back to back we haven't stopped um, uh, e any week at all and this week tcs came forward to uh, present a unique topic i'm sure nowhere else in india any pulmonology society has not covered so far about this unique topic that is drowning and underwater lung issues what happens when a patient when an uh, individual gets drowned and how to resuscitate what are the measures that we need to take what are the problems that we we deal so for which we are blessed to have a a wonderful panel right across from uh, many cities of india let me welcome dr kumar doshi sir as an expert panel as mayank saxena is not at available i took over to moderate for the time being to introduce the panel but ultimately i'll hand over um, moderation responsibilities to dr kumar doshi sir till mayank arrives so welcome sir sir is a senior pulmonologist and a marathon runner so currently practicing in sunflower clinic in mumbai welcome sir once again we are really delighted to have you as an expert today and uh, uh, the next participant uh, expert is dr rafi s a rafi my good friend and uh, a very great human being and uh, working as a senior pulmonologist with care group of hospital hyderabad and uh, uh, dr rafi welcome he is going to deliver a talk on management issues with drowning patients and next coming to uh, dr sudarshan potal sar is hails from odisha and uh, works as a associate professor with jagannath institute from odisha so welcome it's really you no know, pleasure to have you today this evening to discuss about today's unique topic my dear sister dr deepthi from hassan she works for, as an assistant professor with hassan medical institute and uh, i'm sure uh, her experience in managing these cases and then would throw a lot of light into this evening's webinar and welcome dr samir vaidya from indore so i'm um, and uh, he's a good friend of mine looking forward for his inputs to this evening welcome and uh, first of all we'll listen to dr samir vaidya and then to dr rafi before uh, heading to panel discussion and i request all the participants delegates to pour in with some common questions and then unique questions which comes to your mind so that our expert panel will deliver the solutions to and clarify your all dilemmas over to dr samir vaidya thank you so much mayank sir good evening to all the cci members first of all i would like to uh, thank the cci committee for giving me this opportunity to present this very vast and diverse topic and i am going to start my presentation with a simple and very interesting quote the irony is that we spend our 9 months of existent continuously surrounded by water but the rest of life we are always scared of submersions we'll quickly go through the definitions that drowning is death resulting from suffocation when uh, immersed submerged in a liquid medium within 24 hours and if there is a survival for the first 24 hours after the submersion it is called near drowning okay so this is the difference between drowning and near drowning coming to the next uh, important thing is what is dry drowning 
it happens because of sudden immersion in water that causes laryngospasm which leads to asphyxia and the result is that alveoli are dry there without water and uh, if there is an underlying condition like a heart disease alcohol or epilepsy and that causes drowning then it is called secondary drowning immersion syndrome is a syncope provoked by bradycardia or arrhythmias that precipitates because of sudden contact with the temp uh, water at a temperature at least 5 degrees celsius less than the body temperature submersion injuries any submersion resulting in hospital admission or death whereas a save is a rescue or removal of a victim from water by someone who perceived the individual to be potential victim of a submersion injury so these are some important definitions that we must know another important thing is what is active drowning and passive drowning in active drowning the victim is conscious there is a thrashing on the surface of water he remains he or she remains vertical and is unable to call for help whereas in passive the uh, victim is unable to stay afloat and unable to fight on the surface he submerges becomes apneic and there is an imminent cardiac arrest there are some important risk factors which cause drowning most important being inadequate supervision and an overestimation of swimming capabilities people think that no i can swim in even in the uh, uh, running water there is a risk taking behavior for some people hypothermia and then associated trauma like uh for uh, trauma to a rock or something like that um, associated stroke uh, cardiac event then some developmental or behavioral disorders in ch children and hyperventilation prior to a shallow dive another very important risk factor and hence that uh, i have taken it as a separate entity is effect of alcohol almost 50% of adult is because of alcohol and there is a 37 fold increase rise uh, increased the risk if the concentration of alcohol is more than 150 there is direct concentration effect relationship and most importantly the contribution is that because of uh, alcohol uh, consumption before boating swimming this causes a, a, a risk taking behavior and also people underestimate and misinterpret the safety measures like wearing a, a safety jacket or something like that coming to the main part what is the pathophysiology so there is a, a chain of event that happen after patient uh, uh, just comes into contact with the water and that leads to further event so first thing is the there is a uh, period of panic and loss of normal breathing pattern there is breath holding and struggling to stay above the water this causes reflex inspiratory um, efforts and uh, uh, which causes aspiration of water followed by apnea the cardiac arrest occurs from hypoxia and is preceded by bradycardia and pulseless uh, electrical activity also hypoxemia affects every organ system of the body most importantly the neurological we will go in we will see every system uh, in bit detail this is a simple flow chart that causes immersion in um, that, that shows the sequence immersion causes breath holding laryngospasm and aspiration of water all three things combinedly cause severe hypoxemia and hypercapnia and uh, leading to cardiac depression and asystole uh, aspiration is uh, because of uh, unexpected submersion and that causes voluntary apnea the apnea leads to high levels of co2 and low levels of o2 that causes involuntary breathing and results in further aspiration of water in many of these the laryngospasm relaxes because of hypoxemia and this causes further aspiration so the consequences of aspiration is dependent on the volume at around 2.2 cc per kg of aspiration there is hypoxia at 11 there is blood volume changes at around 22 there are electrolyte changes however the average aspiration is only 2 to 4 uh, ml ml that is cc per kg now also there is difference between fresh water and sea water drowning in fresh water drowning hypoosmolar water uh, compromises the surface tension of alveolar surfactant and there is an imbalance in ventricular uh, sorry ventilation perfusion ratio that causes alveolar collapse and there is a shunting both true absolute and the relative intrapulmonary shunting happens in uh, drowning in fresh water the water enters the lung that is quickly absorbed into the blood stream this has this water has a lower solute concentration and therefore the fresh water is absorbed across the alveolar membrane into the blood stream this causes dilution and there is hemodilution of the blood in fresh water drowning this also affects blood cells and tissue membranes causing hemolysis and destruction of blood cells and the chemical changes can result in cardiac dysrhythmia this is a flow chart that shows fresh water respiration which is hypotonic hemolysis also pulmonary uh, surfactant dissolution alveolar collapse and finally hypoxemia whereas in salt water respiration there is there are the alveoli are filled with uh, uh, salty water that causes perfused alveoli but uh, the uh, uh, vq abnormality happens because of pulmonary edema 
the salt water drowning causes hemo concentration which is opposite to what cause what is happens in fresh water there are something called rip currents these are narrow surface current just below the uh, running uh, uh, the surface of the sea that are running away from the land and people many time neglect these rip currents and they take patients to around 100 yards into the sea water this flow chart depicts how salt water respiration Uh, affects the physiology there hypertonic uh, water passes into alveoli causes hemo concentration and leading to hypoxemia now coming to the individual systems if we see in pulmonary the fluid aspiration causes varying uh, degrees of lung injury both fresh and salty water cause alveolar capillary membrane disruption and they increase the uh, permeability of the membrane the fluid shift result in non cardiogenic edema ards finally leading to hypoxemia decrease lung compliance and perfusion mismatching pulmonary symptoms can develop any time in the initial 8 hours after a drowning event and are unlikely to uh, develop after this approximately so uh, coming to the next important uh, part is the neurological part this happens mostly because of the hypoxic ischemic injury and uh, which are these uh, cerebral edema intracranial pressure elevations are observed approximately 24 hours after injury and they reflect the severity of the neurological insult and that flow chart shows how uh, laryngospasm causes cerebral hypoxia acidosis and finally brain injury next important is cardiovascular effects they stem from mainly hypoxemia and hyper uh, hypoxemia and hypothermia there are dysrhythmias tachycardias bradycardia finally resulting asystole ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation are rare and uh, are likely to occur from underlying structural or ischemic heart disease next important consequence is hypothermia patient uh, goes into a cold diuresis because there is a vasoconstriction so the organ sends that the uh, uh, vaso con uh, and uh, peripheral vasoconstriction and vasodilation to the core organs this causes over uh, cold diuresis leading to hypothermia hypovolemia and further hypotension there happens a autonomic conflict of dual activation of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic response other systemic side effects also happen like metabolic respiratory acidosis sometimes multi organ failure renal failure and hemolysis and coagulopathy may occur now coming to next thing what is difference between hot water and cold water immersion so the thermo neutrality point is decide uh, is considered to be around 35 degrees plus minus 0.5 some examples of hot water immersion are hot water tubs while pouring hot water over the head or during diving or competitive swimming in warm water the uh, the pathophysiology is that because of the hot wa uh, water and high humidity the peripheral cooling is not so good and increase heart rate so there is tachycardia cutaneous thermoreceptors interact uh, this causes increase heart rate which trigger ventricular arrhythmias and so uh, patient is likely to develop asystole there is also dehydration and cause leading to thrombosis in cold water immersion the responses are uh, evoked by skin cooling which is called cold shock then there is superficial nerves uh, in the limbs and finally cooling of the deep body tissue which is called hypothermia so the main uh, thing that happens in cold is decreased breath hold time patient uh, during uh, because of cold responses the breath holding time is reduced the response starts in water at around 25 degrees it peaks somewhere between 15 and 10 degrees in the first 30 seconds of immersion and attenuates during the next 2 to 3 minutes this is a nice uh, picture that shows how uh, cold water uh, cold uh, water responses and it affects the cardiac activity and causes arrhythmias now the uh, important and for us it is very common to see that patients after drowning have developed pneumonia the main causes of pneumonia are respiration also it depends on whether the event was primary or secondary then content of aspiration whether it was contaminated chemical composition and gastric aspiration or after drowning develop nosocomial pneumonia which are common so the common organisms are gram negative bacteria and in gram positive streptococcus pneumonia is the most common there is something also called shallow water blackout it is a sudden loss of consciousness which is caused by oxygen starvation and uh, loss of uh, because the patient uh, because the person who uh, dies they uh, tend to lose uh, uh, consciousness because of loss of oxygen and around 7000 drownings happen every year 
Decompression illness is basically divided into two important parts. A uh, simple minor is decompression sickness, and other severe one is pulmonary overinflation syndrome. So, decompression sickness is when the bubbles are trapped in uh, joint spaces and they cause pain at the joints, most commonly being the shoulder joint. Uh, the longer one remains at the depth, the more bubbles will on gas, and the ability of these bubbles to be reabsorbed into solution or off gas will depend on how many gas bubbles have accumulated. So, and there are two types. Type one is where pain only, and type two are more serious and include cerebral, cerebellar, spinal, and inner ear DCS. Next uh, important uh, complication is pulmonary overinflation syndrome. There are four basic uh, parts of this. First is gas embolization, pneumothorax, then mediastinal emphysema and subcutaneous emphysema. This is the serious part and it happens because of the rupture of the alveoli from which air escapes into the mediastinum. To conclude, drowning is death due to submersion within 24 hours and near drowning is survival within 24 hours. Drowning causes reflex laryngospasm that initiates cascade leading to hypoxemia, bradycardia and death. Systemic effects include neurocardiac metabolic imbalance and hypothermia. Aspiration effects are quantity and content dependent. Fresh water drowning causes hemodilution, whereas salt water drowning causes hemoconcentration. And decompression illness comprises of decompression sickness and severe POIs, which is a severe life threatening disease. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, presentation of, uh, on drowning today evening. And I thank um, CCA for giving him an opportunity to um, be part of this program. And then um, that was an excellent presentation by Samir. And then I would uh, move forward from what he has left. Like, I mean, only the management part, what we can look into in a few slides. Uh, without any uh, time delay, let's uh, move ahead with the slides. Drowning, especially when you look at it, has been a very varied uh, topic where uh, drowning is, it could be like a just a drowning with the, your face and nose and uh, into the water to a, uh, in a small uh, tub or even compared to little ones, kids to the even the alcoholics who have like really lost consciousness and then been accidentally got into drowning versus somebody like an extreme sport where they dive from a cliff and are from deep diving, all that. Also, are the uh, ones which we can look into as uh, causing uh, drowning related problems. So when definition you already knew it seen uh, drowning is a form of violent asphyxial death and then aspiration into the air passage is caused by complete and partial submersion of the uh, fluids which is getting into the lungs this death occurs either due to the entry of the fluid in the respiratory passages or due to the effects of the severe water or electrolyte imbalance so uh, as i mentioned there is no need of a complete submersion of the whole body but it can cause uh, severe consequences as well Etiology, when you look into it, it's usually unintentional. Uh, this is the third most leading cause for the unusual, unintentional injury death, according for about 7% of the all injury-related deaths. Okay, Major cause of disability death, particularly in children. One-third of the survivors usually sustain moderate to severe neurological sequelae. That is the more um, a painful part when post-recovery having a neurological sequelae. And looking at the physiology briefly also, uh, hypoxemia and acidosis have been explained already. But the organ systems, uh, when you are looking into it, uh, severely involved are central nervous system damage because of the hypoxemia sustained during the drowning episode, primary injury, and ongoing pulmonary reperfusion injury, or multi organ dysfunction, secondary injury can also cause uh, prolonged, cause because of the prolonged uh, tissue hypoxia. Just as a, to look into the slide, dry and wet has been mentioned here, aspiration of water or into the hypopharynx, and then sudden laryngospasm, parasympathetically activated, uh, dry or wet, 10 to 15% dry, wet is 85%. Dry is refers to the drowning secondary to airway, wet refers to the drowning secondary to aspiration. You've seen this, and then causing a cerebral hypoxia, acidosis, cardiac arrest, etc., and then brain death. Types of drowning mentioned here. Again, this slide, I will skip it. Medical conditions. 
seizure disorder is one thing accounting for 7% of the drowning uh, um, related uh, deaths when you see that the patient might be already a seizure pa disorder patient and also long qt syndrome is one of the things where we see that uh, having a sudden dry aspiration kind laryngospasm happens and with the altered autonomic activity and that is also one of the causing a um, you know rhythm disturbances and then suddenly succumb other conditions when you see predisposed depression coronary artery disease cardiomyopathy hypoglycemia hypothermia okay so this slide has been mentioned and they've been displayed you know displayed but i think has been explained earlier and also mentioning of warm and cold has been done in the drownings just to mention uh, temperatures warm water drowning is more than 20 degrees cold water less than 20 very cold is less than 5 and then what happens in fresh water drowning to briefly to look into this slide i think you already gone through this uh, just to have a look salt water drowning hypertonic it is uh, what happens actually in the salt water drowning has been explained already but it's just as a schematic here for you but when you look at other organ systems what changes happens in the drowning uh, usually renal system acute tubular necrosis cortical necrosis renal failure can happen gastrointestinal system serum hepatic transaminases and pancreatic enzymes derangement bloody diarrhea can happen with mucosal sloughing uh, vascular system diz hemolysis thrombocytopenia those are the important ones we need to look into actually moving on to the management even though i spent some time couple of minutes here Management, I would want to focus just, you know, there is only two segments to it, pre-hospital management, post-hospital, you know, once you reach the hospital, the hospital management. These are the two segments broadly you look into in the drowning. So both are very significant. Rescue the victim, remove from the water is the immediate most. That means in the vicinity when the drowning happens, immediately he's been rescued. That is the biggest saving factor for a, a drowning patient. Prompt insertion of the CPR and activation of emergency medical system. Okay, to so broadly look into the CPR, I think this might slide might not be clear, but I'll just read for you. When to initiate CPR? Initiate ventilation in persons with respiratory distress or respiratory arrest in order to prevent the cardiac arrest. Initiate CPR in persons who have been submerged for less than 60 minutes and do not have obvious physical evidence of death. That means rigor mortis, body decomposition, those etc. are not there. That point of time is time lapse is less. You start off initiating the CPR. When to discontinue, when you when, uh, continue to basic life support unless signs of life reappear. After your trial, rescuers are exhausted or advanced life support teams are take over. Advanced life support people would, once they take over, you can actually discontinue your CPR. Once they take, continue advanced life support until patient has been rewarmed, hypothermic, and asystole has persisted more than 20 minutes. More than 20 minutes asystole is persisting. I think there is no point in uh, continuing the resuscitation cardiopulmonary resuscitation so when you look into the art, goal of pre-hospital care the maintain adequate to maintain adequate oxygenation and then circulation minimize secondary organ damage and take proper precautions to stabilize the most important is cervical spine as well those injuries also have to be uh, prevented especially uh, mucus especially fluid uh, can be removed by the back wall masks especially in the kids um, they can do it. Or inflation of the lungs must be avoided to prevent the pneumothorax. So when you're doing the bag, bag masking or mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing, I think much less uh, risk, but still has been mentioned here. Elevating the head of the bed 30 degrees, but not the actual uh, uh, head, but I think whole bed probably can lift it up to avoid the spinal injuries. Intubation is the one when the advanced team reaches there, they probably take over in an unconscious patient. Cardiac monitor is used to look at the heart rhythm disturbances. And uh, when you look into these important facts of the predictors of outcome of resuscitation of a person who has drowned, here again, duration of submersion and risk of death and zero, severe neurological impairment after hospital discharge, zero to five percent, 10 percent, five minutes is 10 percent, six to 10 minutes, 56 percent, more almost 25 percent is 83 percent. More than 25, I think that, that there is no chance of really survival, brainstem injury, predicted death, severe neurological sequelae. These are expected. Explaining the, to look into it, basically, uh, ABCs, management, airway, breathing, circulation. That is a pre-hospital management. Monitor pulse oxy, maintain cervical spine, administer, because advanced 
uh, life support comes, they immediately probably they can do a little bit of sodium bicarbonate correction, acidosis, provide warmth, passive rewarming, rapid transportation. Once it reaches, patient reaches the hospital, uh, there sometimes happens is like patient is already with the pre-hospital management itself gets out of the risky situation and then he's better. But it's only an assessment once he reaches the hospital. That is a fantastic situation. If not, continue the pre-hospital goals of maintaining adequate oxygenation, circulation, and initiate the other treatments on the basis of laboratory and radiological findings. Arterial blood gases may indicate the need for correct acidosis and sodium bicarbonate. As I mentioned, hypothermia is initiated with the bomb. Uh, blankets, oxygen fluid, and electrolyte correction be instituted. The patient observation in the stable condition after initial rescue emergency treatment be done there. So hospital admission, uh, hospital management usually, if as I said, everything is all right, uh, probably you observe six to eight hours and then record vitals and then check and re ABG looks all right. You can actually send them home. But uh, what are the lab tests in that uh, hospital site? You immediately see is an ECG, uh, you know, any chest X-ray to see the pulmonary edema, when uh, also very mild electrolyte changes that are all there, you look at it, moderate leukocytosis possibility. DIC is occasionally, that is when actually you actually hold the patient back and then treat them. ABG might show metabolic acidosis, hypoxemia. And then freshwater aspiration with the hematocrit hemoglobin, usually normal initially. Freshwater aspiration, the hematocrit may fall slightly in the first 24 hours due to the hemolysis. Increase in the free hemoglobin without a change in the hematocrit is common. So this is one of the parameters you would see in the hospital when you repeat the hematocrit. So these are the ones we said, but on the same token, when do you use a prophylactic antibiotics? Before that, actually, we need a sick patient who is hooked up to the ventilator. I'm imagining that has been happened. I'll just come to that. But role of prophylactic antibiotics, when you see these two will come back. So role of mechanical ventilation and drowning. Mechanical ventilation is often used when supplemental oxygen alone is insufficient. Other indications include decreased consciousness state, cardiac arrest. So you need to watch for when you're using a mechanical ventilator, avoiding the pneumonia, barotrauma. So uh, that is the main. So for that, the method you use is a lung protective ventilation, which is like a low tidal volume. Practice this currently advocated in the treatment of drowning patients and then assessing the neurological status and the hypoxic encephalopathy, one of the complications. So this is a ventilator management as well. But role of prophylactic antibiotics when the patient to be admin like if it is the drowning material what is easy and contaminated water obviously otherwise a clear pool river lake not necessary but typically when the hooked up to the ventilator prolonged period of time probably staphylococcus atypical coverage antifungals as well in those patients uh, depending on the need bronchoscopy is also depending on the need actually it is there is no definitive role and the routinely but I think to picking up any secondary pneumonia or a foreign body stuck in the airway, if you are thinking in the trachea, et cetera, and the lower lobe collapses or any atlectic uh, segments opening, toileting can be done with those. So in the ventilator strategies, when we continue, so pre-increase need to be achieved with, to reach an adequate oxygenation, but not pushing it to the level where a lung injury happens. Lung protective strategies would be starting in the low tidal volume I mentioned. Hypoxic ischemic brain injury is there. Permissive hypercapnia should be avoided. This is another key ingredient you should look for. I think these are pretty much uh, four or five ingredient points where you look into the management of the uh, drowning patients, no matter a type of uh, drowning and all that. When you look at the prognosis here, uh, poor prognostic signs include unwitnessed event. So that is the key unwitnessed event, prolonged period of time it has been taken at the site. And then when you come back, it will be like a late already, but is a witnessed and then recovered quickly, probably have a better chance. And then the neurological prognosis is to be looked at which where patient arrive at the comatose state to the emergency department. And uh, absence of cognitive function 72 hours after the hypoxic episode strongly associated with the death or survival of the persistent vegetative state. So CPR, we mentioned more than 25 minutes, fixed pupils, those routine ones have been administered. This is a, a like, you know, submerged for more than 10 minutes till BLS more than 10 minutes, CPR more than 25, initial GCS is less than five, age less than three, CPR in ER. Initial ABG pH 7.1, initial core temperature less than 33. These are all the key ingredients selling back prognostic. So how do you avoid 
is the only way is prevention target education i think there are many uh, informative uh, flyers and and then uh, you know uh, learning and training things when they are uh, initially in the stages when they are going for swimming etc and then all the sports or uh, extreme sports all those have to be looked at very a uh, safety profile they mentioned in lot of things and uh, um, to go back and see technically at the on site is important and then once you come to the hospital and then post that recovery neurological status these three th- things are very important and then addendums are antibiotics and bronchoscopy support we can take um thank you thank you dr samir and dr uh, rafi that was a wonderful session and i must congratulate and i must compliment dr krishna dr vijay and dr atri that they have come up with this beautiful uh, idea of uh, getting this uh, uh, com- this webinar on uh, uh drowning that we i have not seen in any conference or any forum that this topic has been touched upon and this is actually very important and uh, it's a very common scenario that we see the drowning and uh, even in, uh, uh, in i think every 2 uh, 3 uh, months or even uh, some in some places we may see even month the cases of complicated drowning that we come across and there always a dilemma like when to use antibiotic when to use bronchoscopy what to do what not to do what uh, uh, ventilation uh, uh, protocols to follow so i think uh, this is a wonderful uh, session for and uh, uh, in the need for everyone to know so uh, uh, after this wonderful presentations i would like to uh, start the discussions and uh, the discussions today will be touching upon basically that is already covered in the slide but it's just a more elaboration and the views viewpoint from the panelists uh we have uh, uh, the esteemed panelist panelist uh, dr kumar doshi dr deepti dr samir dr uh, sudarshan dr uh, rafi uh, uh, like uh, uh, it will be a plethora of knowledge today that uh, our esteemed panelist will shower upon so uh, very uh, just to start with this uh, this one a very uh, interesting concept that that we have read in even forensics also the dry and wet drowning so i would start with uh, dr sami basically just uh, 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 to start with like uh, uh, how to identify the first uh, rescue protocol like it, is it a dry drowning or a wet drowning because and what impact it has on like on the management part like if the patient has come across in uh is there any identifying features or any uh, change in a protocol if it is a dry drowning and uh, 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 wet drowning i am talking about the first rescue protocol that one has rescued and now what to like uh, how to assess for the dry and wet dr samir okay so thank you sir for the question but uh, the thing is that dry drowning uh, the pathophysiology differs from wet drowning the dry in the dry drowning the basic thing is the laryngospasm because of the coldness or the because of the panic uh or because of the vagus stimulation there is a sudden laryngospasm that causes the hypoxia and the asphyxia and the good thing that written in the everywhere is that dry, lungs are dry in uh, uh, dry drowning whereas in wet drowning uh, the lung the water or the any liquid that uh, the patient is submerged that enters the lungs and then it causes all the consequences so now how to identify i think the basic and simple thing is uh, uh, simple auscultation would uh, confirm if there are crepitations uh in the uh, uh, lungs then it is obviously dry drowning second thing the effect so the laryngospasm uh, which happens it directly affects the heart so if there are primarily arrhythmias occurring uh, or there is a uh, the activity heart activity is not regular or a patient has come into asystole then uh, we need to see uh, we need to uh, i mean uh, uh, suspect that this is a dry drowning and then we need to start the management from the cardiac point of view we need to resuscitate from the cardiac point whereas in a, a wet drowning where the water has entered we need to focus first on the lungs part or maybe electrolyte imbalance or hypoxia and so on or maybe a positioning of the patient so that is the basic uh, two differences uh, which will be there in dry drowning and wet drowning okay. dr kumar you want to add something now uh, uh, we must because it's more of a practical uh, webinar we must understand that these were terminologies introduced to explain how the pathology started in dry and wet drowning 
but these terminologies are no longer kind of used neither accepted because once you have asystole and severe hypoxia even the laryngospasm releases oh yes okay, sir and the patient being submerged water is eventually going to enter inside it is just was there to describe the difference in the pathophysiological mechanisms therapeutically has no uh, meaning so we should be very careful that when we are treating the patient these terminologies are not or how the pathology started probably is not going to change how you are going to treat the patient that's a very valid point because uh, uh, ultimately uh, the uh, management may be similar for the even the dry or even the wet and it has to be just a, a few checkpoints that we may need to keep a follow up in the uh, uh, later on but yes uh, as we uh, see the patient may be apneic or he may be in a asystole so as a first respiratory protocol we have to follow the basic uh, uh, cpr and basic uh, 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 things uh, so coming on to the uh, basic uh, uh, like pathophysiology we have seen it has been explained very beautifully uh, about uh, how this uh, different uh, salt water sea water and uh, everything has got a impact so my question is uh, with dr rafi like uh, how like for, from the long term protocol basically how impactful it would be the sea water versus the fresh water like any changes in the management uh, any change to follow up or uh, like and one more thing what would be the duration uh, uh, difference like uh, if i see uh, uh, like uh, for the sea water and the fresh water is there any duration difference like if uh, the like sea water is more harmful or sea water is more problematic or or uh, compared to the fresh water like uh, can you explain on that part dr rafi um on the more it looks like i mean technically i mean because of if it is unseen prolonged time i think we can call it both would be more uh, 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 you know life taking things but on the same token uh, when you have uh, sea water i think more it causes a bit of uh, you know hemo concentration in the uh, lung itself and then uh, in come you know immediate flooding of the uh, can happen whereas uh, that that is i think a more of an immediate danger you can see when rather than the fresh water um on the same token in fresh water uh, thing the patient in like next 24 hours you would see a more uh, um, recovery um, uh, that's why we have called i think samir also has mentioned like in the easily the drownings like 24 hours before and then after so that is when i think even even 20% of the patients your neurological uh, assessment uh, has to be done i think that is actually determines the post recovery neurological status is also actually cripples the patient at times so that will actually uh, categorize the patient who is more sicker uh, after the recovery okay. uh, uh, fine so that's a very important point uh, because uh, ultimately uh, basic protocols are being followed and ultimately uh, the uh, the uh, uh, pathophysiology does makes the changes the sea water seems to cause more harms but ultimately both any drowning will be a disastrous event for anyone uh, then then uh, coming on to uh, doctor uh, 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 doctor deepthi uh, about the question uh, that i just a second yes so uh, like we see the cpr uh, protocols uh, for uh, 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 the uh, patients of drowning and uh, we come across in various uh, in, in including the films and all uh, like uh, we the patient is being turned prone and there's thumping that is going on or even the use of suction like uh, the basic cpr protocols are being followed but yes uh, what are the role of these uh, things that are being broadcasted in various various uh, uh, mass media and all the Uh, things and any role of suctioning uh, per se as a first rescue protocol so thank you for the question um i think number one in drowning is uh, when the person who is rescuing the uh, person who is drowning they should keep in mind to uh, themselves uh, they should be safe and number two uh, the uh, attempt to uh, you know start a cpr or uh, do a resuscitation should be delayed till the patient is uh, uh, the person is brought to the ground 
so there should not be a immediate attempt to start uh, resuscitation and start uh, you know uh, uh, punching or doing anything mouth to mouth whatever it is first uh, safety protocol has to be followed and the patient has to be brought to the shore uh, or to the flat ground number 3 is ventilation so in any other uh, as in any other cpr protocol uh, we have to do airway abc airway breathing and circulation so open the mouth check for any obstruction whether a uh, seaweed or any other foreign body anything else has entered the mouth and that can be removed uh, you know per se immediately so if that has been that part has been followed next uh, if we have to check for the breathing if there is no breathing then immediately five rescue breaths have to be given on spot and if those five breath rescue breaths have triggered the breath uh, for the patient and patient has started breathing then we, we switch to the normal uh, uh, pulse checking the pulse and going for uh, the 30 chest compressions and the uh, breaths again two breaths so 30 is to 2 ratio we again follow but uh, whatever protocol we are following we what we have to keep num- uh, in mind is uh, any obstruction is there that has to be removed immediately so that is when this mouth to mouth and all this uh, being shown in the uh, films comes in so we are trying to give rescue breaths uh, immediately by uh, mouth to mouth which not many people may be uh, willing to do so that is where suctioning and all this but uh, how much of that is really available in that surrounding whether uh, you know uh, the if it's a really uh, well uh, maintained swimming pool or anything then they may have a pair first aid kit they may have suction uh, uh, things ready there so any bag mask ventilation is available so anything of that kind if it's available then yes we have to use but let us also remember that uh, whoever is doing the rescue part uh, number 1 they have to call the team immediately the emergency team has to be informed so that that uh, less time is wasted on uh, the cpr on station let us shift the patient to a, a more organized uh, setup immediately rather than uh, wasting a lot of time on the uh, uh, place of uh, the uh, drowning very well elaborated dr deepthi yes uh, uh, because uh, as a normal basic cpr protocol we always see look listen and feel basically so we always look for the obst- any obstruction any obstacle in the mouth we clear it because in any case in any drowning in the like uh, rivers or anything there can be a, a obstruction in the mouth so anything we have to start we have to clear out the obstruction so that the breathing passage can become normal and then only then again uh, 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 the seeing the assessing the patient not starting with the cpr act one but assessing the patient any for anyone is important and calling for the help even if you are doctor even if you are at the first rescuer you have to follow the basic minimum protocol that has been set for the cpr as a uh, on the side basically so very well elaborated now coming on to like uh, 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 about this that burning that burning question that i reserved for dr kumar is about the role of bronchoscopy is basically <laughs> so when you will consider it because there is like there is always a tendency when the patient comes in icu to the bronchoscopy you get the things out get the thing what would be the role in the sea water fresh water versus even the drain or sewage or some uh, we see a lot of patient uh, with alcohol and accidents uh, getting into drains and all the dirty waters uh, how will you place and what would you the specific timings at if at all uh, where you will place the bronchoscopy in a drowning Uh, after uh, patient has a right to hospital dr kumar sir so your question arises if there is a bronchoscope in the icu where the patient has been taken if there is an accessibility to the bronchoscope and the patient has an airway already secured the threshold to do the bronchoscopy should be low it is of immense value to clear the large airways to the maximum possible limit few things which you have to understand that the pulmonary edema which develops in sea water drowning is not the classical transitive pulmonary edema which happens in high pressure or lv uh, Uh, issues it is a uh, exudative pulmonary edema whatever you can remove you remove to achieve 
a good VQ. As Samir has shown in his pathophysiology, the only thing which leads to catastrophe in drowning is hypoxemia, whether it is dry or wet, hypoxemia related events, hypoxemia induced TPA activation and DIC, and hypoxemia induced capillary permeability and severe pulmonary edema. So the first thing after you have secured the airway is to put in the bronchoscope, a quick scope. I'm not telling you to go be with the scope inside for a very long period of time. A quick scope in and out. If you can, there is something foreign, you get it, get the muck off. That will get the best access to the airways. The only disclaimer to my opinion would be, uh, I don't think there are any guideline recommendations to the therapeutic uh, approach to drowning. Neither are any very specific papers to, for or against bronchoscopy. But if I have an airway secured and have an access to bronchoscopy, my threshold would be very low, especially if it's seawater. I would think twice if it's a freshwater drowning, certainly, if the patient has not been in for a very long time. I hope that answers. Yes. And what about the like, uh, uh, patient do come with the sewage and all, all uh, even there's that. So you will consider that also? Where will you place oh, yes, uh, the of course. Uh, that, that That's just a cleansing job which we have to do as far as possible. Because no matter how many times you are going to do the bronchoscopy, you are not going to get clearance. But it pretty much rest assured that in the first two, three times, whatever you can clear, you can clear. Because you also have to understand that these patients are severely hypoxemic. Your bronchoscopy also has to be very, very careful that it should not propagate the hypoxemic injury which the patient has already acquired. So there is no fun in going with a scope and staying in for a very long time and worsen his hypoxemia. So it has to be quick bursts of scopy, 20, 30, 40 seconds and out, 20, 30, 40 seconds and out. And we'll have to walk the tight rope in giving ventilation and establishing a clear airway to the best of our abilities. So that, that answer, I think all the main queries for the uh, role of bronchoscopy in the uh, uh, drone patient. And now but coming on to the right, sir, please, uh, please. I, 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 I deliberately did not uh, tell you what I would do if uh, I don't have an access to the bronchoscopy. So my question to all of you would be like, if you don't have an access to a bronchoscope and the patient is already having an airway, would you not do a suctioning of this patient? So bronchoscopy is nothing but a guided suctioning. And you can reach all the 19 segments. So thereby, if you are going to not think twice before suctioning the patient, there is no reason to think twice before scoping the patient. And moreover, uh, if any, like if I'm, if we are talking about the uh, uh, obstruction in upper airways, there can be any obstruction on any uh, chances of any. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. So we have to just at least visualize. And at least see for sure that we have removed the basic main things. And then, so threshold, I agree, should be low. At least a look down should be done for the uh, patient who has come after drawing with the with the maintenance of the uh, hypoxemia should be corrected and should not be uh, uh, propagated but for the sake of surprised, But you will be surprised that a majority of the bronchoscopy is done in patients of drowning they have never found a foreign body inside. Our larynx and vocal cords are really great. They don't allow much to seep inside excepting the fluid, which it just breaks all the barriers. But uh, majority of the scopies which have been done inside have hardly ever ever seen a foreign body which can sludge may be there, uh, high proteinaceous material may be there, but very unlikely that you might see a foreign body. So sludge, I agree because I have uh, gone. Uh, um, I don't know my area. I have done two, three times. Seen the patient for that. So <laughs> the drain is coming again and again. So I have gone through myself and saw a few times like uh, uh, there had been uh, so much of sludge inside, and we have cleared it out. But yes, 
not any large foreign body that I could have come across. I, I but yes, seen. it should be a look down Broncos. Right, sir. And uh, like on follow up also, sir, Broncos, so we do have rules. As you have said, all, uh, as a patient, like we uh, see a patient uh, uh, in ICU. So follow up, follow up scopies are going to be purely. Follow-up scopies are going to be purely dictated by the condition of the patient. If he develops a collapse or if he develops an atelectasis which needs to be opened to normalize the VQ ratio. This, this scopy, as I said, the least threshold you should have is on presentation moment the airway is secure. After that, we treat this patient like acute lung injury getting into ARDS and we don't routinely scope patients who are, because these patients are on going to be on lung protective strategy ventilation. They are going to be on high peep. They are going to be on a, a peak pressure which will be less than 30. The volume will be very 6 millimeters. During doing scopies in these controlled ventilatory settings is not going to be ordinary. In fact, these are the scopies which might induce a barotrauma to these patients uh, 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 in the follow-up cases. So that time you better be cautious and your need should be guided by the clinical condition of the patient. Right, sir. So that is a wonderful elaboration. I, I think must have answered all the questions related to the bronchoscopy's uh, role uh, during and after the droning in the ICUs, basically. Uh, now coming on to the one more burning question and that I'll be uh, asking from Dr. Sudarshan about the choice of antibiotics. We have seen uh, the role of antibiotics uh, about uh, uh, by in Dr. Rafi's presentation. But if any specific choices that can be, you know, starting, starting antibiotic or starting no antibiotic or starting antibiotic, my would be this, if the patient is just uh, normal, we have to just see. Or in a, in a case of droning that is not requiring even the admission, basically, it's just a rescued person who has just into a state where he would have become critical but has revived and has come across. Is there any indication of uh, 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 antibiotic? Then the patient who has been uh, requiring the ICUs in the uh, uh, normal, like uh, in a fresh water drawing, what are the choices of antibiotics in those third case scenario where the sea water drawing, what could be the choice of antibiotic in the first stance? Is there any difference with the fresh water? So uh, final one is in the, like uh, as always bring in the point of drain and all in the sewage uh, related drawing. What would be the choice? The the, the, the form of the antibiotic you can name like what to start with basically. Doctor uh, Dashan, over to you. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for a question. Um, but thing is that uh, practically, uh, whenever we think of uh, prophylactic antibiotic uh, provided, we should think of the uh, infection, bacterial infection. But unfortunately, uh, uh, the cont uh, whenever there is a chances of contaminated water, generally we are planned for the antibiotic. Now already, as uh, our previous speaker already told about that, is because uh, uh, chances is hardly is uh, based on the uh, literature available. Hardly is a uh, chances of pneumonia in ventilated patient in drowning. Hardly is a roughly around twelve percent like that. So that's why uh, prophylactic uh, role of uh, Prophylactic antibiotic is very minimal, but uh, still uh, some requirement is there whenever we think of any, say, ventilated associated pneumonia, like our previous, they, if there is any evidence of uh, prolonged fever, uh, sustained leukocytosis and or uh, persistent or a new uh, pulmonary shadows or any uh, leukocyte response to tracheal aspirate. In that condition, we may think of uh, uh, giving the antibiotic. But as our previous speaker already told, that communist organism is usually gram-negative. So accordingly, we have to choose uh, preferably beta-lactam, beta-lactam, uh, inhibitor like antibiotic. Uh, but the uh, uh, thing is that uh, in, uh, in addition to whatever the discussion, the last, uh, the role of uh, bronchoscopy, like that also, if uh, in this case, in, if you think of the ventilated acetyl pneumonia, at time bronchoscopy may be required uh, to identify the causative organism. This is from me, uh, me sir. Over to you, sir. Uh, that's a good elaboration. Uh, Dr. Dipti, if you want to add something to it, uh, if any more uh, input on uh, this topic. Sir, uh, just last week, coincidentally, we had a drowning case uh, of an alcoholic young man. Uh, who was uh, not uh, getting any uh, expectoration. So it was very difficult, but he had bilateral uh, uh, alveolar infiltrates and uh, with hypoxia. 
So in such a situation, we had to go for bronchoscopy, and bronchoscopy revealed klebsiella. So even uh, klebsiella, though we are uh, uh, heard and read uh, uh, it to be a, a lower uh, presentation, but in this case, it was a bilateral uh, alveolar infiltrate, and uh, it was uh, responding very well to our uh, beta lactam. So uh, I, I, as uh, Sir rightly pointed out, Dr. Sudarshan said, gram-negative uh, organisms are more common. Uh, definitely, though uh, we may think of fungal and other uh, organisms, I think basic coverage, uh, if there is uh, uh, lung infiltrates on an x-ray, definitely we have to start uh, antibiotics, preferably covering for gram-negative. Kumar sir, if you want to add something. Uh, I uh, hear Dr. Sudarshan's and Dr. Deepti's view and uh, endorse with both of them. Uh, but just uh, uh, a word of caution. Uh, in a patient with drowning, we are playing with time. Uh, we, we may not have enough time. We may not have time till the x-ray comes back. We, it would be seldom to see that the chest is clear on auscultation. I personally believe very strongly that the first dose of a broad spectrum antibiotic should be administered at presentation and then wait and see whether it should be continued and it's, it's a very clean case and we may discontinue it. And I have reasons for that. Uh, majority of the drowning are either suicidal or accidental. None of them, very rarely, they are homicidal. The suicidal ones who are drowning, they may not have only drowning as a primary pathology, they may also have polytrauma. So there might be some other injuries which also might take precedence. And those which are going to be accidental, invariably are going to be inebriated as Dipti's case was under the influence of alcohol. These patients might have even aspirated even before they drowned. So we you'll realize that in most of the patients of drowning, you are essentially treating an aspiration pneumonia on presentation. And therefore, if you are treating an aspiration pneumonia, a first dose of a broad spectrum beta lactam antibiotics covering both for gram negatives and positives, and if possible, even atypicals, you give. Then as Dr. Sudarshan said, if the chest x-ray is absolutely clear, as in when it comes, the chest is fine, patient is recovering, okay, we may not give any further dosages at all. I believe that could be a, a, a middle path to be rational at the same time, playing more safe depending on whatever we are seeing and literature says to treat a patient of drowning. And I would also like to add that uh, it is very common uh, uh, to get a history of vomiting in these patients. Exactly. Those who have uh, uh, had this history of drowning usually come back with that history also, that this patient had vomited. So we never know that even that vomitus would have been aspirated. So in such it a would condition, be. Yes. It would be. So I think it is better to uh, give, as uh, Kumar sir directly said, a, a first a stat dose can always be uh, added. And what, like, what would be the role of anti-anaerobic, like uh, uh, antibiotics, uh, like clindamycin or even the antinarobes? Uh, when, when would you consider it, basically? Uh, any specific situation or any specific circumstance, like you said, aspiration or any other, like, please. So as as I said, sir, I think the history will reveal it. If it right. is a contamination, if it is a sewage, and or, or if there is history of vomiting. And I think all these conditions, definitely we should cover for androbes also. And while we wait for the culture reports to come back. Right. So that's that's actually very interesting because the droning patient, as you have said, uh, even uh, we have to think in a broad broader way from, from the all aspect, like from the polytrauma also, from the multi-system also. And from uh, because uh, uh, these patients may have a compromised kidney. So we have to uh, actually adjust the dose according. So it's like, we have to follow them up and we have to eventually change according to the culture reports and according to the 
basic uh, recovery of the patient. So as Kumar sir has already rightly said, the time is a very, very key factor. If my patient is not improving and I think the sepsis is kicking in, I would escalate antibiotic without even waiting for the cultures, I think, right? So uh, that's a very uh, inciting uh, point about the antibiotics in the drowning patient. Now coming on to the role of ventilation, basically, as we have already seen in the previous slides uh, by the presenters, uh, that uh, 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 the basic protocol, that ARDS net protocol that we follow is being uh, like, rightly followed here. I just want to elaborate a few points just to clear any misconception or anything uh, that may come up. Many times patients do come right from the uh, uh, droning sites straight away because they may not have a, a intubating equipment. We are seeing as a protocol, sometimes patients are being put up on NIVs and all. So how to start with like you straight away intubate the patient, take the patient on a, 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 a patient who is not maintaining, able to maintain. Uh, so what what would be the protocol? So my question is uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Rafi basically about uh, how to go about the ventilation? Is it like a normal, like uh, any ARDS patient we see, NIV followed by ventilation, ARDS uh, protocols? And uh, how to follow up these patients on the ventilator, basically? When to consider ECMO even? Because these patients can be a good candidate for even ECMO, basically, because these patients may ha have isolated lung injuries that may respond over time. Or uh, uh, maybe even the even the lungs are not responding. May consider for the even a higher transplantation. Maybe, like in but, fir bhi, uh, we have to see how to proceed. Doctor Rafi, uh, I would like to know your viewpoint on the ventilator strategy. How to proceed and how to take it forward. Like, well, in this, uh, I would actually think that Kumar uh, sir is a probably an appropriate guy. But I think I'm a purely you know clinic pulmonologist. But we have a strong uh, critical care team uh, backing us up. So I think I kind of take it easy when the patient comes. But I think what I can say as on site, if the patient is really quickly picked up and then being saved as a basic initial one, uh, when uh, my practice, I worked as a critical care as well. So more, about, you know, 70 to 18% of the patients probably wouldn't even need a ventilator. Where you're seeing, you just assess, you do arterial blood gas. And then you see that he's uh, been out of the uh, you know woods, and then his hypoxemia is getting corrected after giving a you know a whatever little uh, uh, acidosis which is there being corrected with the uh, in the you know uh, in a ICU setup immediately. At that point of time, probably uh, you would want to just check uh, his oxygenation is all right with the EBG. So once it crosses, if it is not, I mean it's brought in a comatose state already intubated. Uh, on the way itself and then brought to the ER, I think obviously as lung protective ventilation is the, the category, no matter what is the insult, like what kind of drowning, it doesn't matter, but I think lung protective one and immediately as uh, rightly Dr. Kumar is, uh, point, uh, sir has pointed out, uh, quick check bronch, I would say is like you no know, rescue plus or minus check bronch, what you would do and immediately in that, but at the same time ventilator strategies, I think high you need to definitely give a high P, but not to the level where it is uh, not causing a barotrauma. And then the low tidal volume. High P, low tidal volume is one which I can usually say on the top of my head. That is the one strategy you should follow in these uh, ventilatory settings. And then uh, pick it up from there about the uh, nuances of it. I think um, uh, after that, I think managing would be is a purely... Uh, you know, ongoing uh, a dynamic process. I think uh, Dr. Kumar sir can probably chip in here. Kumar sir, so, uh, I personally, uh, you know, that's why whenever we are discussing uh, any disease, I believe the treatment is decided on the first presentation. Let's look at it in a very, very simple a guy picked out of water and brought to land. Only three possibilities are there. He is conscious and breathing. He is unconscious and breathing. He is unconscious and not breathing. There are only these three possibilities. Now, if he is conscious and breathing, as Deepthi has pointed out, we have to do the ABC, make sure that the airway is okay. You don't move your neck here and there because you might have a neck injury. Try to get whatever things you can outdo. Once you reach the hospital, uh, you do the routine suctioning. Give them high flow oxygen. And if he's fine, you leave him alone. You do nothing at all. 
if he is unconscious and not breathing that is the point where the als or the advanced life support system comes into picture that routine methods of suctioning may not be sufficient and you might have to intubate this patient to secure the airway now moment the patient is intubated all other modalities of ventilating the patient excepting invasive ventilation is out of the window there is no niv nothing remaining there is only invasive ventilation remaining with you and that's what you do so non invasive ventilation would thereby be an option only for those individuals who have been picked out of water and they were conscious and they were breathing but they were very tachypneic they were losing out they were passing out and if it was a fresh water drowning and is picked up he's already developed metabolic alkalosis acidosis because of the hyperkalemia and that is the time you give them non invasive ventilation correct the acidosis in 6 to 8 hours time there is a very good chance that he will cover up and dr sudarshan pointed out you may do the x ray and you might even find that thing normal and you might not have to proceed but if he is unconscious and breathing and you have to secure do anything more to create secure an airway even beyond, beyond the large airway or to intubate the patient it is only invasive ventilation as i have made my point uh, earlier that your threshold of doing a bronchoscopy should be low your threshold of starting an antibiotic should be low your threshold of even intubating this patient should be low because these are the patients which are very gratifying to treat if treated aggressively because please remember most of these patients were pre morbid probably 15 or 20 minutes before this episodes were completely normal they had no problems in life all you have to do is to achieve the homeostasis back and you are as a you are just playing with a very short window of 20 30 40 minutes and if you can achieve everything in that time you have hit the goal thank you sir it is it is like uh, eye opening for i think everyone because uh, sometimes we may wait around and see if the patient is how the patient and we are slowly increasing up the oxygen and all but yes there should be low threshold for intubation in these patient if they are not improving well in time so uh, i and i just got a message and uh, i must congratulate uh, dr nh krishna cci and everyone that we have got 916 uh, logins uh, today and uh, uh, congratulations even to the team sipla who is arranging and uh, managing all the technical support that is, that they are giving us and uh, it's 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 gratifying to uh, see that uh, people are actually uh, very much interested in listening uh to the topic that is mostly not so covered in the uh, various conferences and uh, this uh, is very good uh, i must say and uh, uh, just few days before we have heard the titan disaster that uh, uh, we are aware of because uh, there was some uh, deep sea diving exploration so my question is from dr samir basically suppose if, if fortunately the people have been uh, located and they have been brought up, up up uh, in a uh, like from uh, down and from that like all the people who are going into the deep uh, diving exploration and uh, suddenly like they come in a drowning scene and rescued and brought up how will you approach those patients who are coming from the deep uh, uh, exploration specifically and this and this is a very this can be a very common scenario because uh these days the uh, even uh, tourism has opened up the crews and everything is opened up so you may be stuck up in a situation where you may find a person who has been rescued up and now it's over to you dr samir how will you approach that patient he may be coming up from the deep diving he may be having any case and sorry when uh, like we have uh, seen in your presentation how will you approach that patient over to you so basically uh, when patient ascends and the pressure uh, in the uh, reduces so these illnesses are divided in two basic parts the decompression illness we call and first is sickness and the other is over inflation syndrome so the more common uh, or the uh, more prevalent one is the decompression uh, sickness and this happens because the air which is trapped it expands and particularly mainly in the joint spaces and teeth and everywhere so peripherally it does that and the most common symptom for this is the pain so patient presents with shoulder pain or maybe jaw pain and uh, body ache and everything like this so to approach we need to first see uh, uh, the patient will give us the symptom and patient will give us the clue that how the severe or uh, the disease is or what uh, stage he is if the patient is very hypoxic or he has uh, gasping or uh, he is uh, tachycardia 
then we should suspect the severe form which is called the overinflation syndrome in which the alveoli they rupture and the air leaks into the uh, mediastinum even the decompression sickness is divided into two part the type one is the uh, lesser part where in the shoulder or knee pain happens and the type two is the severe form where headache and middle ear pain uh, or the backache ensues because of the air trapped expands in the cranial cavity or middle ear so uh, to approach first we need to ask the patient and see the patient what are the symptoms and how is his clinical condition uh, to add to it the the thing that which i came across while making the presentation is that nowadays there are uh, very good devices and software which tells you that how uh, can we reduce this complication or how to ascend even though even of a presence of all this help and even of the technologies uh, unfortunately patient land up with decompression sickness they are unable to have the regular stops uh, where uh, uh, they should stop in the ascent so that the uh, air is gradually expanded so even after this patient do have decompression sickness and they do have pain and they do have everything which is uh, complicated so if the patient is vitally stable he is just complaining of pain it is a simple decompression sickness whereas if a patient is having uh, uh, hypoxia and tachypnea or he is gasping then it is a overinflation syndrome so when you will be consider uh, like any role of hyperbaric oxygen or any any anything like that uh, that you may consider for uh, in any of these patient like when to do what so there is not a particular guideline that this happens so we need to give hyperbaric oxygen uh, if the patient is symptoms are less uh, severe and the, then we need to just observe or maybe some uh, uh, painkillers may have uh, may, may have roles but if the the patient is persistently having a very severe pain or it is a type 2 dcs or is uh, going into over inflation syndrome yes there all uh, the hyperbaric oxygen should be given and as early as possible it should be given right so there is actually a very interesting episode uh, from dr house if everyone knows dr house is a very uh, good series about so there is a one just a, a small uh, uh, clip I, if i may uh, 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 tell you that uh, there was a patient in the mid of flight Air who plane. has started yeah has started there symptoms, was skin uh, skin discoloration symptoms he started yes every like very strange symptoms he started and uh, dr house somehow diagnosed that it is a change in altitude because of day before he was in deep diving in the sea and the next day he was uh, up straight to 35000 so he diagnosed in mid flight so it is you may never know what what you may come across so it is always in, important to look down into the history look down into cause and also uh, the specific scenarios you are in very uh, good uh, dr samir uh, uh, now uh, coming into the mainly preventive aspects and uh, we see why dr krishna has uh, come up with this idea because 25th july is actually world drowning prevention day so uh, let's because uh, it's it's a very big I, I i may tell you one more thing in noida that we are i am residing recently the swimming pools are closed for the children below 10 years it is like complete close, complete in the summers everyone want to go swimming the children are being exempted from uh, like they are not allowed even to enter the swimming pool area so this is a fear uh the drowning may get because there may be few uh, here and there incidents but in if, if we see abroad and all the people uh, uh, advocate like children in uh, getting to the swimming and getting into the all the activities that they must learn in so basic uh, thing is like from dr sudarshan what preventive strategy you would see you would see in a like a uh, like in a household or in a uh, in a let's say swimming pool area in a residential area basically to avoid the swim to the avoid the basic drowning that occurs in the swimming pool areas for the kids and all how like and what preventive protocols like in should be in place like uh, what a basic strategy should be there to handle those uh, patient any specific protocol like oxygen should be there suction machine should be there uh, any anything uh, protocol based that you may suggest let me benefit all the listeners uh, even uh, because these clips uh, these uh the uh, 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 lectures do get uploaded on youtube and watched by the even the non medical uh, personnel so it it may be helpful for everyone so how you will change or what strategy strategy you will uh, formulate for the residential or uh, swimming pool areas basically dr sudarshan over to you uh, yes yes sir actually yes, sir uh, uh, who uh, as, as you told uh, correctly the world uh, drowning preventive uh, Uh, the prevention day and uh, July twenty fifth. And uh, based on the WHO, uh, give six uh, tips uh, particularly for prevention. 
नंबर वन इज हाउ टू ट्रेन द बाइस्टेंडर और सेफ रेस्क्यू और फॉर एज क्विक एज पॉसिबल फॉर जी एंड अर्ली रिसर्च टेस्ट नंबर टू सेट एंड एनफोर्स सम सेफ बुटिंग और शिपिंग ऑफ सम रेगुलेशन फेरी रेगुलेशन नंबर थ्री पार्ट दे वॉन्ट टू इनफोर्स द इम्प्रूव द फ्लॉड रिस्क मैनेजमेंट and uh, number 4 as you told that uh, majority of uh, the victim is children and that's why uh, uh, they install some barriers uh, control to reach the water particularly these are the few points uh, but important part again the, they want to uh, teach the school uh, students uh, because they are the more more vulnerable groups uh, particularly teaching uh, for uh, how to swimming how to um to improve the uh, skill of swimming that's why but uh, ideally important part is keep uh, yourself uh, safe and keep others safe uh, that means as i have uh, narrated the keep yourself safe uh, uh, means uh, learn swimming uh, uh, water safety survival skill uh, and as also obey the all uh, safety signs and uh, warning flags uh, which are the are it can in the swimming pool area also and uh, important part again the never uh, go to the water uh, with help uh, drinking alcohol and uh, always try to uh, if you were a beginner of swimming always try to help uh, life guards and keep other self uh, means again uh, as already uh, explain little bit about uh, swimming area with uh, life guard uh, set the rule of water safety always provide a close constant attention to the children whenever uh, you are uh, supervising in or near in or near the water like that this is almost uh, uh, important preventive measures uh, to uh, advocate both uh, for adult and as well as for uh, children also this is over to you sir very nicely elaborated sir and i must add to one more point that Uh, many times these incident occur when the a person is swimming alone basically there is no one in around area and uh, you are swimming along because in one incident a singer basically uh, died in some hotel in singapore because he was swimming in, in a uh, isolated uh, 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 time when no one was there so always make sure when uh, like when you are swimming that there should be some person uh, here and there that must keep a watch on uh, you know. one of the risk factors is overestimating one's own swimming capabilities yes. Doctor Kumar, please, sir. And always a casual uh, activity yes, rather than high dependent. Yes, Doctor Rafi. Yes, uh, sir. You were saying something, Doctor Rafi. I mean, uh, I am concurring with you. Like by always uh, swimming is something which is like not uh, you go by alone. I mean, usually you need to have a company and then go for swimming. So. because we have done like we seen like uh, in the early, uh, I wanted to give a sam example like uh, you know canal is there. outdoor the swimming like one would be overestimating like one uh, you know another person is there we two are swimming the other person is overestimating and then he wants to cross the canal when almost it took him for about until he get tired completely and then not able to reach the other side because the flow is so high and uh, you know you need a expert swimmer to get in there from the other side and then save him such a simple task and then would have lost him that day so right, yeah so so the point to... i wanted to make is uh, uh if there were a larger enemy of a human being more than his own intellect there is no one it is easier to train my pet dog than to make a human being follow rules that's very difficult i am into marathoning and uh, when uh, we are training and we follow a protocol and invariably you will find somebody who is not fit enough i would say okay i am doing 12k today well, no 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 i am going to do 15k today so oh wow, great so what did you do last week so i did 5k and then suddenly he wants to graduate to 15 so it's very very difficult to educate a human being because he has so many urges and such desperation to break the law that is more difficult for him to follow the law 
having said that few things are unpardonable you have airports equipped with defibrillators right, but we don't have swimming pools equipped with defibrillators you have alcohol breath analyzers on the roads in the hands of the road traffic but you don't have breath analyzers on the beaches and on the falls where every third day you find that there are two or three teens who are going into the, the uh, so as i said i am not going to be able to prevent those teens getting into the waves but after they get into the waves i have nothing i just lose them because i don't have anybody on the protection boundary so uh presence of defibs in a swimming pool of course there has to be someone to use it so a presence of defibs in a swimming pool more use of alcohol breath analyzers in public places especially those large waterfalls where they go and they get swept off as i said you look good into the statistics 85% of drowning is accident only 15% is uh, suicide now those ones which are accidental they are either have been just they have lost their balance and fallen off as happened in bandra last week in mumbai where a woman was just posing for a photograph just a simple photograph a wave came from behind and she just uh, she was lost and the husband survived the wife died so uh, that is unfortunate but those accidental drownings are the ones who are as some you said they have overestimated their capacity to how much depth they can get into the water but they are inebriated also so we should be having methods that such people cannot be there at that location in the first place like when it is 31st of december you have alcohol analyzers at all the public places but you don't have it on the couple of beaches which that lines uh, in puri dr sudarshan you yes, just sir. have three or four beaches where you can go so why can't there be three or four breath analyzers not a great big deal but we don't have these basic things in right so unlikely right, unfortunately we lost 25000 patients last year and i'm sure we are going to lose more but we will not be able to change the habits of people but can we do something more to those who committed an unfortunate mistake and give them a second chance to live we just can't penalize for them having made a mistake once so i uh, to add that uh, the, as sir rightly said it is entirely a government policy where they have to have compulsory lifeguards at all tourist spots especially uh, beaches i think uh, uh, lifeguards are important flotation devices are important and as sir said if possible even breath analyzers and defibs i think if this can be a government policy then it is going to be much easier to uh, uh, follow so i think uh, uh... let's uh, move to certain questions that uh, we have uh, just got uh, dr tanushri galor from uh, uh, noida uh, region is asking uh, uh, i think this question must be asked for dr rafi and dr samir because they have come across a presentation what uh, any major guidelines that are there for the droning uh, related uh, 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 patients how to manage and uh, uh, like where we can find uh, any gu- guidelines are there for the droning patient dr samir and dr rafi uh no i didn't find any particular guidelines on the uh, sad part there there are no even good uh, studies and there are not even good uh, anal- meta analysis or any thing which have uh, st- like have focused on drowning it's a i mean i could not I find that's, like, that's, I want, a, that's I want, a need, I, need of all i think yeah i wanted to because of the all the discussion which have been gone through i wanted to add like even i've seen like if there is any you know st- statistics are there statistics are uh, there when you look into it for everywhere like how much percentage there are only data on the patients or number ah, of patients the data but there is no you know public health analysis of public health approach kind of measures are there any activity or uh, more towards the drowning or like public health uh, campaign or public health uh, research on this uh, uh, drowning and all that kind of articles are also not there i think one one reason for this is that because the beaches or the rivers they are at a very peripheral and a rural level and then the patients they get admitted in the local hospital maybe so uh, while most of them they do not reach the tertiary centers where good studies or good uh, clean uh, um, uh, such people are available so i think one of I the think we, yeah, often see, we often see a drowning patient it's not 
that uncommon that uh, they reaches to the tertiary and we come right. across and i think uh, let's uh, ask uh, dr uh, krishna and uh, dr atri and dr vijay to let's kick in up and uh, let's uh, cci formulate a proper guidelines like how to manage a drowning patient that would be really helpful and that actually can be pasted across the even for the public health domains and even for the uh, even in the base uh, in the icus from that uh, secondary and tertiary cities so uh, one uh, important question also like uh, we have seen uh, 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 by uh, dr tridip chitraji is asking uh, from mumbai maharashtra any role of steroids uh, dr kumar do has answered but i would want a little more elaboration like uh, dr kumar if you can answer any like it when, when yeah, uh, one of the biggest pathophysiology as samir has described in his wonderful uh, uh, outline is that they develop severe bronchospasm most of them would see we have developed severe bronchospasm and a uh, uh, initial bolus dose of steroids to relieve as i said you have to not only secure the airway you have to reduce the airway pressure itself if you don't reduce the airway pressure and then if your patient requires ventilator and you ventilate you are going to create barotrauma and volute trauma both so thereby giving steroids to reduce the bronchospasm even reduce the submucosal edema is going to be a very very important strategy unless the patient has an absolute clear chest and is not a very severe drowning case and all that yes steroids have a very large role to play in the management and i think laryngospasm edema will the upper airway edema will also uh... yes yes of course of course of course in fact what, what uh, let, let me go to let me go to a very very uh, different uh, pathophysiology altogether in patients of myocardial infarction they give steroids to reduce the av nodal edema so it has a very big role over here so we want to reduce edema from here to here so what would be the uh, choice of steroid and doses like is, it would be hydrocortisone or a, a methylprednisolone or, oh. or, or okay so we we are we are we are not going to give the pulse doses of methylprednisolone so that goes out of the window we are going to give anything which is going to be 40 mg methylprednisolone equivalent three times a day which probably equates to about 150 mg of hydrocortisone three times that is only on day 1 then you rapidly come down you will realize in a patient of drowning in 4 to 6 hours if you have achieved something you have achieved if you have not achieved it's bad luck for the patient so uh, as we see the steroid uh, like uh, as we see a lot of drowning patients some areas particularly so if what what would your role of any uh, like uh, isolation icus are these patient more prone to get infection any any role of like we see in burns patient we isolate them any role of any specific icus or any specific uh, place to keep them up dr kumar No, no, no. They can be treated in the standard ICU. In the standard ICU. Oh, I, I would rather want him to be in ICU in front of all the. As I said, it's a very, very crucial couple of hours. I don't want him to be in isolation where he's not seen at all. Any ICU, uh, uh, the team has to be very, very trained to give a lung protective ventilation strategy. There should be an arterial line in situ to get repeated gases. I want to achieve. a uh, normal capnia normoxia and normal acidosis as quickly as i can may i also uh, add uh, even normothermia for that and normothermia yes dr deepthi last minute question like uh, radiology in a drowning patient like in a uh, like a role of ct scan would you do it or would you not do it or it like any specific indication where you will put in a ct to be uh, done because uh, many times we see irds take picture it's like our main preference that they get the ct done get the ct done. is it that necessary in a patient whose cause is known we are just uh, is it necessary to take that risk to shift the patient to get the ct what additional information we may get and when when is a real indication of ct scan that may arrive sir number one indication would be that we are ruling out underlying lung pathology so in any patient we are not assuming that it is a normal lung so unless we are uh, uh, we know the history of the patient we know the patient prior uh, we are let us not assume that it is a normal lung so we we, we should know exactly what we are dealing with uh, uh, when we are treating this patient uh, as a drowning patient so uh, for that matter if the x ray is not uh, reflective of that uh, if a lot of shadows not really clear picture is there definitely a ct is indicated but apart from that uh, if it is only a ground glassing and it is an ards picture i think not really indicated more majority of them respond well in the initial uh, phase and repeat x rays itself are uh, much more helpful than a ct 
Sometimes Dr. Samin, any role of yes, yes, please. Yes, sir, I would like to add to the just the investigation panel. Uh, we also need to focus on the cardiac activity. So while mm-hmm. making the presentation, I got to know that ca- ca- cardiac uh, involvement is very serious. So maybe echo or maybe repeated ECG. So if there are arrhythmias or uh, electrical, uh, the activities are irregular. So we need to focus. M- so more important than CT, getting a CT scan done is uh, getting an echo done or a repeated ECG done. It's a basically a comprehensive management that yes. we, we have to see, and ultimately, even the, even the, the antibiotics can be guided by the uh, procalcitonin. Also, if we yes. are seeing the patient is uh, okay. not that much improving, and we want to kick in with the antibiotic more, if maybe we can just routinely follow up the procalcitonin, pro BNPs, and all. So I think that's imp- that's what Dr. Kumar, you were, you Dr. Rafi was. Yeah, no, nothing. Go- I'm just uh, trying to add uh, to Dr. Deepthi's uh, point: uh, radiological imaging. Technically, these patients also need to see about, you know, sometimes the injury related circuit emphysemas or, you know, in the pneumothoraxes, which not uh, actually hidden, pricked up, uh, you know, around mid especially in the central locations. CT might help even in the immediate CT, if you're thinking not picking up by the chest X-ray, that is one thing to look at because immediately you're feeling suspicion and then doing a CT is one of these indications not to pick up bug or a suspicion of a high bug. Right. So I think uh, uh, we have covered in detail from the uh, pathophysiology to the management to the prevention and uh, even the role of bronchoscopies, antibiotics, and also uh, about uh, different uh, ventilation strategies that we may uh, uh, see in our patient uh, and uh, different case scenarios from the sea water to uh, fresh water to even uh, dry drowning to uh, wet drowning. And uh, uh, it's a comp- droning is always a, a complex situation, but I think first of all, hundred percent of droning are preventable if we have taken the right steps uh, at the prevention point as we have maintained. Even if the droning has occurred, a right uh, CPR strategies for the patient uh, timed appropriately at the appropriate place, making the patient and yourself safe is very important. And uh, uh, then uh, shifting uh, and also calling for help is is also equivalently uh, good. Then transferring to the patient to the uh, uh, appropriate critical care areas where this these patient has to be managed with the appropriate antibiotics, bronchoscopies, and uh, 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 ventilation strategies. And with the uh, with the time, we have to assess also for the check of additional factors like bronchospasm or even inadvertent pneumothoraxis or uh, even subcutaneous emphysema or pneumomedistanum. And also the situation where uh, we have to take a little detailed history also where the patient is coming up, uh, whether the patient has alcohol intake history, all the uh, immunocompromised factor of, uh, 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 or even the cardiac status. And accordingly, we have to follow up the patient uh, till the and also to see the neurological and cardiac condition and eventually these patients m- may be saved and uh, should be saved with the aggressive protocol there should be no wait and watch policy we have to be a little aggressive on the patient side and as dr kumar has already said when these patient brightens up and recovers it is actually absolute marvelous feeling that one uh, a, a doctor can get a patient who has been in a in a good state get in, get into a messy state and then coming out of that state from the life threatening state is always a gratifying situation. So I think it was a wonderful uh, evening and wonderful topic to cover up. And uh, we have we have tried to cover up in all the details. And I thank Dr. Krishna, CCI, Dr. Atri, Dr. Vijay, oh, Dr. Uh, I have a question. Right, right now, please, please. If, if, if the panel doesn't mind, uh, I would like to know what is uh, the uh, expert's opinion regarding the your role of diuretics? Yes, one point was, <laughs> please, doctor, uh, open is like, uh, uh, question is open to the forum, please, anyone can answer. Because uh, whatever uh, studies I have read, uh, none of them mention any role. As I told the, the, major... the, the pulmonary edema in uh, non is exudative. So diuretics are not going to be of use. Secondly, the age group of the patients who succumb to drowning is middle age, 18 to 45. Rarely it is going to be middle aged or higher unless there is a accidental and these patients may have something comorbid separately and you need diuretics. That's a different story. Per se for drowning related pulmonary edema, no. It is not like HAPE. It's quite contrary to that. Thank you, sir. In fact, 
the hypoxemia related pulmonary edema which develops in hap the same hypoxemic mechanisms need but here there is so much of capillary damage and exudative pulmonary edema so much so that it has a dic also so it's going to be completely different and no diuretics are not the drug of uh, it is not your first armamentarium in uh, and Dr. it may further worsen even i would like you to it's like a dh it's like a dh of ild with the <laughs> dic <laughs> <laughs> and even yeah. in the sea, sea water drilling it may it may uh, uh, complicate the hemo concentration it, that it may be already the hemo concentration yeah, yeah. so I think uh, this can be a time of concluding the session. Thank you, uh, everyone, especially Dr. Sami, Dr. Rafi, for the wonderful presentation. Thank Dr. you. Thank it was you. it was really superbly done and concisely done. Thank you, Dr. Mayan, for that wonderful moderation. Thank you, Dr. Deepthi, Dr. Sudarshan, and Dr. Rafi, Dr. Samir. Everyone has been best today, and uh, thank you for participation. And uh, I thank all the audience. to be a part and sipla team for providing the technical support thank you so much thank you everyone. thank you very thank much you. and good night